$17.5 billion. That's what California spent fighting homelessness over the past four years. Housing is a big issue in our country. However, it's really huge for California. And while the Golden State has given out billions of dollars worth of stimulus checks and financial aid, they still haven't figured out how they can actually solve some of the problems, some of their biggest problems, as a matter of fact. So here's a good question. Were you guys aware that California has spent at least $17.5 billion on trying to solve this issue? Yeah, I didn't stutter here. I said a billion dollars, a billion would it be? But, and here's where things get kind of blurry and confusing. Within that time frame where they spent billions of dollars, so that's around what, 2018 through 2022, their homeless population actually grew. <laughs> what? So how did that happen? They're spending 17, 18 billion dollars on this problem and the problem's steadily getting worse. And you do know what they said about it, right? A senior advisor to Governor Gavin Newsom said that things would be much worse if they didn't use that money. Well, then what the heck did they use the money for then, right? Like with that much money, the state could have paid for rent for all of these unhoused people for four years, even with the high cost of rental properties over there. I mean, can you believe this? Now, I know that California provided a lot of free money to residents, but seven $17.5 billion and they have nothing to show for it? $17.5 billion. That's what California spent fighting homelessness over the past four years. At the same time, the homeless population of the state grew by around a third. The problem would be so much worse absent these interventions. And that's not what people want to hear. I get it. We get it. Here's some reductive back of the envelope math. With $17.5 in theory, the state could have just paid the rent for every unhoused person in all four years. It is reductive, and can I say why with respect? Perhaps that would work for me, because I don't have significant behavioral health challenges. My reductive math did leave maybe three billion for mental health and other services, but even if the state did just offer to pay the rent, there just aren't enough affordable houses to go around. There is a state plan to build two and a half million more homes by 2030. A million among them must be affordable, but when it comes to housing, Zoning is ultimately down to local government. We've got communities in this state that are refusing to build low-income housing. Why do so many Californians become homeless? Even when we did have a job and we tried to look for housing out here, it was like impossible. Rent is too high because housing supply is too low and many who fall into homelessness say it's really not by much. But bigger picture, longer term, at the end of the day, if we want to truly solve homelessness in America, we need to build more housing. That starts with us. Well, if you're from Cali, best ask the office of Governor Gavin Newsom, huh? And remember when I said that the state provided a lot of stimulus checks for their residents? Experts are now saying that all of this extra money is wearing thin. And so even though consumer numbers continue to remain strong, Wharton professor Jeremy Siegel, he warned that the ride's almost over. Why? Well, he says that the only consumers who are out traveling and enjoying the summer are the same people who live by these four letters, YOLO. You only live once. Basically, it's people that live every day as if it's their last. And yes, you know, I get the the idea of living life to the fullest but if you're seeing shark warnings at the beach and you continue to swim down on the deep end you're probably asking for a lot of trouble are you one of these people and speaking of trouble dr anthony fauci might be in some deep waters again as even more incriminating evidence has come out that he may have had a hand with the narrative pushed by the origin of the c19 virus while actually suppressing the thought that it actually came from a lab now dr david asher who is part of the state department's investigation into COVID's origins says this was a cover-up watch now they're basically saying that you know they had that thesis all the way up to just before the publication basically of their paper um and it, it was essentially rejected by by fauci and by uh nature medicine itself which is also complicit the cover-up is so much more extensive uh and and i can only imagine what's going to come out in the coming weeks as more of Fauci's internal communications are, are uncovered. Now, before I go any further, do we really need any more evidence to say that Fauci's actions during this time was extremely questionable? And if he lied before Congress, will anything be done? Now, I'm asking these important questions up front because I get that we sometimes talk about this a lot, but it feels like we're the only ones who are informed about it. It kind of feels like we're the only ones who even care. By the way, if you own a home, make sure your home is protected. Get your free home warranty quote. There's a link in the description down below below in this video. So anyway, from this investigation with Dr. Anthony Fauci, we could see just how they wanted to move away from the lab leak theory. They wanted it so badly and it involved many different people, one of which was Dr. Anthony Fauci, of course. When you look at the beginning and origins of COVID, he had business, legitimate government and business interests in what was going on at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. 
He didn't want that to be exposed for wh whatever reason, because of that research, because of the funding, because of people he was connected to, because of his relationship with China. We don't know, but he quickly realized this is a problem, and whatever the real story is needs to be pivoted to this is a natural origins theory. And, and getting accountability for that will feels nearly impossible. Right? It just had such a drastic impact on all of our lives. Now, if you know about the paper called The Proximal Origin of SARS-CoV-2, then you would also know that they use this as the defense for any thoughts that this virus came from a lab. It became like uh, Captain America's shield, but instead of protecting the American people, well, you, you guys already know that they lied to us on several occasions. So, you know, it's really no surprise that they continue to do so. Now, in this paper, you will see a clear statement where the researchers say that the C-19 virus was not constructed in a laboratory, nor was it purposefully or manipulated virus. But hold on, was this entire paper made by scientists and researchers? Well, Technically, no, it wasn't. Now, while you won't see his name show up, Dr. Jeremy Farrar of the World Health Organization, he was involved in his paper. How? Uh, look at this. So this is from the select subcommittee of the C-19 pandemic majority staff. And here we can see that Farrar supported the paper, but wanted a small change. And so instead of using a term unlikely for the lab leak, he wanted to squash all rumors and use the strongest term that he could possibly think of. He basically had them change it to improbable. Now, I love that he even apologized for making this change because it's laughable just how much they want to change the narrative so badly. They were so strict about it that one of the medical researchers prompted by Dr. Dr. Anthony Fauci to author the paper. Dr. Kirsten Anderson of the Scripps Research Institute was told by Dr. Anthony Fauci himself that this paper determined that the lab leak theory was accurate. And as many of us are now aware, Fauci told Anderson that the law enforcement would have to be contacted. I mean, that sounds like a threat, right? Like the conversation probably sounded something like this. You got to disprove this theory because the American public will be pissed at us. So do whatever is necessary to make it look like this wasn't due to some gain of function research over in China. And also, I just thought of this now. Why is Fauci calling the shots on this? It's kind of like having the FBI fact checking themselves, right? Like, what kind of credibility does it actually bring to the table? What do you guys think about all this? Should Dr. Fauci be held accountable for this or did he do nothing wrong? And who do you think should be held accountable for this next problem? Now, before we get into it, here's a very important question for you guys. And I want you to think about it for a second. Like, do you ever connect to public Wi-Fi networks, maybe at Starbucks or, you know, maybe at your gym or whatnot, the library? I mean, me personally, you know, I really wouldn't do that with without using a VPN. In fact, I would rather just kind of use my data plan to the max rather than connecting to a free Wi-Fi network. Because yeah, sure, you're getting access to the internet and you're not spending a dime, but this opens up a lot of opportunities for hackers to go ahead and get your information. And this is exactly what happened in Lansing Community College as a cyber attack that hit early this year, compromised the names and social security numbers of more than 758,000 people. Now just think about that for a second, 758,000 people. And this is a campus Wi-Fi, a connection that you think would probably be pretty secure, right? Now, on the topic of who will be held accountable, well, I don't think that they have any strong suspicion on a suspect. However, they are offering victims with a year's worth of free identity theft protection and credit monitoring services as a way to apologize. It's the least they could do. They also said that the high victim tally may be due to the Lansing's online students, which would probably make finding the culprit even that much harder. And since we've already talked about schooling from home, what are your thoughts on working remotely? Now, I guess it's a polarizing topic, but it really depends on your role, right? So if you're a video editor or you work with programming that, you know, usually has you seated in your workstation for hours on end, then I could definitely see the merit of working from home. But what if you're a bank manager? How does that work? Because JP Morgan CEO, Jamie Dimon is saying that these people can't be leaders and work from a place where they don't have accessibility to their colleagues. And sure, I don't always agree with Mr. Dimon, but it makes a lot of sense here, right? I mean, I can just picture an irate customer who yells out, I want to talk to your manager. Who's the manager around here? And then they would give him like weird looks because all they can say is, well, my manager's working from home. I mean, you can give him a FaceTime call if you want, if he'll take your call. I mean, like seriously, I mean, how would you guys feel about leadership like this, right? Make sure to share your thoughts in the comment section down below. By the way, if you guys made it this far in the video, do me a favor, drop a quick like for the video. Also consider subscribing. I look forward to seeing you guys on the next one. Y'all be safe.